Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Carving It Up Live right here on Facebook Live, YouTube, and on Twitter. As always, I am Bryson Carver. We are presented by The Grid, and we have an absolutely loaded show on tap for you guys tonight. Alfred Parsar Jr., the host of the Rocket Fuel Jets podcast right here on The Grid, will be on the show in about a half hour to talk about all things Jets, uh, as well as some other stories going on in the National Football League. Also, Luka Doncic. How 60 points, 21 rebounds, and 10 assists work for you? By the way, in a comeback that we haven't seen in NBA history, uh, numbers-wise, <clears throat> I'll talk about his performance on Tuesday night and where it ranks among the greatest in the history of the NBA. I'll also discuss the situation with Tua, uh, who's now back in concussion protocol. Uh, Mike McDaniels reportedly uh, ruled him out for Sunday against New England. So yet another Tua concussion. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, stories surrounding that. I'll discuss that later in the show. Um, as well as LeBron James, <clears throat> hats off to LeBron, just flat out calling out the Lakers uh, for for not being able to put a championship uh, roster around him. And I've kind of been on this for around or around a point that I'll make later in the show since probably August, but I'll sort of further elaborate on it later in the show. And at the end of the show today, we got a big game tonight, Week 17, the NFL, the Dallas Cowboys and the Tennessee Titans to kick off the second to last week of the NFL regular season. I'll predict that at the end of today's show. <clears throat> but we do have a loaded show on tap. And I did want to start with one of my favorite quarterbacks in the NFL. And, 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 you know, there's two quarterbacks that I defend just about every time I get the chance to because I don't think they get enough credit for being elite quarterbacks. Number one, I, maybe you've heard me defend him a time or two. Uh, have you heard of Dak Prescott? I think. Oh, that's right. I'm wearing his hat again on the show today. And one of them is Dak, and the second one is Derek Carr. Now, according to multiple reports, Derek Carr uh, has been benched for the remainder of the Raiders' season. They're 6-9. and nine. They're still mathematically, they have a chance to get in, but it's like a 0.5% chance uh, that they'll get in the playoffs at this point. Derek Carr has been benched. It's now going to be Jarrett Stidham for the remainder of the season for Las Vegas. And, you know... I, I saw the news, and I was like, well, first of all, okay, this is the Raiders doing their quarterback dirty once again. But then I was thinking about it. I was like, you know what? This is the best thing that has ever happened to Derek Carr in his NFL career. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because you think about getting drafted in the second round out of Fresno State in 2014 to Las Vegas. And I don't think we – we talk about dysfunctional franchises, right? We talk about Washington – we talk about Cleveland. We talk about uh, they're having a good season this year, but for the most part, they've been dysfunctional. Detroit, I've put the Cowboys in that discussion in part, uh, or in large part, due to the owner. There's many uh, franchises we put in that group. I don't think we get enough, uh, give enough credit to the Las Vegas Raiders, formerly the Oakland Raiders, for how much of a train wreck that they've been. Keep in mind, they have not won a playoff game since... They got to the Super Bowl in the 2002 season. Keep in mind that with Derek Carr, they made the playoffs twice. We say, well, Bryson, doesn't Derek Carr have something to do with that? I mean, he is the quarterback. He's been there for almost a decade. It's a fair question. But I would answer, I don't know, how well would you do if you had six head coaches in nine years? If you had five offensive coordinators in nine years? If you had to deal with the Antonio Brown controversy and drama that surrounded the team in 2019. How about when you had to deal with two years later, the John Gruden controversy that was bigger than even the NFL caused a big uh, 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 you know, whirlwind of stories and opinions from all over the place. Having to deal with that, uh, having to deal with the tragedy of Henry Ruggs, right? Who got arrested and convicted of manslaughter, right? How about dealing with Damon Arnett, uh, having that, the, the gun in, in the uh, Instagram video, how about dealing with other teammates who've gotten arrested for, for DUIs? How about dealing with the fact that five of the Raiders' last six first-round picks are not even with the team anymore? And there's a chance that the one outlier out of those six, Josh Jacobs, probably isn't going to be a Raider next year because he's a free agent, and the Raiders are pretty much out of money. So I doubt they'll be able to pay him. So if you're Derek Carr, you've dealt with all of this, and this is how they react. Bench you after nine years with the team, nine years as the Raiders franchise quarterback. 
You think about Derek Carr's third season in the league in 2016. Guy was right smack dab in the middle of the MVP race with guys like Matt Ryan, Aaron Rodgers, Dak Prescott, Tom Brady. Derek Carr was in that group. And then second to last week of the season, albeit you know in a blowout, they were smoking the Indianapolis Colts, and Derek Carr went down with a season-ending broken leg. Raiders made the playoffs, but they got smacked, obviously, because they had their third-string quarterback starting against the Houston Texans. Five years later, got back to the playoffs. I made the case on this very show that Derek Carr should have finished third for MVP behind Brady and Rodgers. That's how great I thought he was under the circumstances. You're talking about a guy who's made three Pro Bowls. Like, guys, no scrub. Having to play in one of the toughest divisions in the NFL. Hey, how'd you like to face Mahomes twice a year? And then once you got done with an old Phillip Rivers, oh yeah, now you get to face Justin Herbert twice a year. You got to face that Denver defense. Denver always has a good defense every year. You got to face them every season. Well, having to deal with a terrible owner, Mark Davis, that's been proven. Six head coaches, five different offensive coordinators. A controversy revolving around one of your head coaches. A controversy revolving three years ago, basically the best player on your team. Having to deal with your team trading the two best players on the team five years ago, Khalil Mack and Amari Cooper. So to say that I'm happy for Derek Carr, I'm thrilled for the guy. And according to reports, he's going to step away from the team for the next two weeks so as not to be a quote-unquote distraction. God bless him. Good chance he's played his last game as the Las Vegas Raider, and I could not be happier for the man. And you know what the beauty of it is? He's got a no-trade clause. So that means if the Raiders want to screw him over again and trade him to some bad team, he can say, no, 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 I'm not going there. And they can't trade him because he has a no-trade clause. If they can't find a trade partner, they'll release him, and Derek Carr will get to pick wherever he wants to go. I have consistently said he is absolutely one of the 10 best quarterbacks in the NFL. Like, you may make the same arguments for Carr that I did with Dak. As dysfunctional as Dallas has been, it doesn't hold a candle to the Raiders in Oakland and Las Vegas. By the way, he had to deal with the team relocating from the Bay Area to a different state, to a city that's never had an NFL team before. Oh, by the way, while doing it during a pandemic. So... When we talk about, and has Derek caught a great season? No, he hasn't. He's led the league in interceptions. We get that. They've dealt with a lot of injuries this season. We understand all that. I had the Raiders as the playoff team, and it darn sure wasn't because I like the head coach, that being Josh McDaniels. It's because you had Devontae Adams, you had Chandler Jones, and Derek Carr with chaos last year got you to the playoffs. But when I step back and look at this, I could, this, this bad season for Derek Carr and for the Las Vegas Raiders is the best thing that's ever happened to Derek Carr in his NFL career. I couldn't be happier for him. Six head coaches, five different offensive coordinators, having to move from Oakland to Vegas in the middle of a pandemic, dealing with the Antonio Brown controversy, dealing with the John Gruden controversy, dealing with the Henry Ruggs tragedy, having to deal with the Damon Arnett situation on social media. Having to deal with a, now a bad head coach in Josh McDaniels. Having to deal with five of your last six first-round picks have been bust because they're no longer with the team. Having to deal with the fact that the two best players of your team were traded in a four-month span in Khalil Mack and Amari Cooper. Good for Derek Carr. I, honestly, yeah, I've been saying for years, I, I hope Dak gets out of Dallas. Um, same thing goes to Derek Carr. I'm glad he's out of Vegas. And uh, just just genuinely happy that 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 he's going to be able to move on. And y'all are about to see, we're, we're all about to see how bad the Raiders truly are, how terrible by franchise that they truly are next season. So Jarrett Stidham is going to start the last two games of the year. Uh, Josh McDaniels, obviously, is, is, is familiar with him considering the fact that he coached him in New England. They'll find a different quarterback. I'm hearing a lot of Tom Brady rumors. Why the you-know-what Tom Brady would want to go to Vegas? I have no idea. I mean, you asked me, would you, if you're a quarterback and you like stability, where would you rather go, Vegas or Tampa Bay? Now, Tampa Bay wasn't, you know, the model of the National Football League. Uh, but they had a lot better situation. They had Bruce Arians, who's been in the playoffs multiple times, a head coach, more than proven. One of the top receivers in the league, Mike Evans. A great defense. Right. 
Folks, since Derek Carr has been in Las Vegas, they have the last ranked defense in the NFL. Last in points allowed, last in takeaways. That's what he's had to deal with for the better part of a decade. I'm hearing a lot of rumors about the Jets, possibly. That'd be a good fit. J Maybe the Jets have gotten their act turned around. Joe Douglas, the GM, has done a great job. Robert Sala has done a good job. It's a great defense. And they got some real weapons. I mean, we saw once, you know, Mike White was was out of that mix. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, once Zach, Zach Wilson is out of the mix, they actually look like a, a decent offense. Add a franchise quarterback, a top 10 quarterback, an elite quarterback. And Derek Carr to the mix? Hey, that'd be a problem. John Rivera, who is a Jets fan, he is hoping for just that. He says, come to NY. Listen, that would be the best quarterback the Jets have had since, dare I say, the first half of the, gosh, what was it, the 08 season? I think you have the 08 season with Brett Favre. Remember Brett Favre had that? I hate to remind Jets fans of this. I'm going to have a Jets fan on the show in just a second. Um, but I hate to remind him of that. But like that was really the best quarterback play that, uh, that the Jets have seen quite some time. So, yeah, if, if you're able to get... Derek Carr in the building, absolutely. That, that is a legitimate playoff team. Patrick Brown, Chaotic Sports Podcast, shout out to him. He says, Derek Carr has been the steady piece, this the steadiest piece this franchise has ever had. Despite coaching changes, drama, adversity, he was the guy in front of the press. Emotional and then this. Hashtag free Derek Carr. Could not agree more. Could not agree more. Again, what he's had to deal with. What, uh, what he's had to overcome. Yeah, you know, we talk about when teams or when we understand the value of somebody. I've always talked about this on my show. I get real worked up over the NBA's most valuable player because I think the V word is often forgotten. But the true measure of value is when you leave somewhere. And this is in any industry. You know, if, if it's a, a great movie, you know, and you got a really good actor or actress in the role, Ask yourself, could you see any other different actor, actress, a really good one, by the way, in that same role? The answer is yes. Well, maybe the actor isn't as good as we think they are. If the answer is no, well, then there you go. We can bash Kirk Cousins all you want. I've actually kind of defended Kirk a lot in my show. I'm like, listen, the guys, <laughs> the guys had like what, nine, eight, nine game winning drives this year. The guy's putting up phenomenal numbers. Now that he's gotten an offensive head coach for the first time in years, he's got the Vikings to a, I mean, just easy division title. Not easy in that it was easy to get it, but in that they clinched this thing weeks ago. They still have an outside shot at the number one seed. Like, Kirk Cousins had a good year. How's Washington been? How's Washington been since Kirk Cousins has, has left? Conversely, Russell Wilson. If the Seahawks lose out, if the Seahawks lose to, I think they got the Jets and is it the Rams? Rams or Cardinals because they've already played the Niners twice. Uh, and let's just say Seahawks lose out. They'll finish 7-10. and 10. You know what their record was last year? 7-10 and 10 with Russell Wilson. So Russell really wasn't all that important as we've come to find out. Not just by how Seattle's went, but also Denver's went. Uh, oh, okay. I kind of like this, Patrick. Patrick Brown says Miami to me would make sense. Add Derek Carr to that offense with Mike McDaniel's a play, your play caller. They'd be in playoff contention. Carr throwing passes to Cheetah and Waddle plus the strong run game. I like that. I like that because, I mean, look, Miami is still probably going to get in the playoffs now. It'd have to be absolute madness for them to miss it. Um, Teddy Bridgewater is a more than capable backup. I, I certainly give them a good shot at winning uh, against New England on Sunday. So if they win that, they're in the playoffs. And then the seven AFC playoff teams are pretty much set. But yeah, that'd be a that'd be a great fit, I think, for Derek Carr. Yeah, I mean, Mike McDaniel's done a phenomenal job developing Tua. Give him a franchise quarterback who's still, I think, in his prime, the prime of his career. You give him the weapons. I mean, the problem in Vegas is not necessarily the weapons. He's got Devontae Adams. He's got Hunter Renfro and Darren Waller, Josh Jacobs. It's the play calling. It's the awful situational football. I mean, folks, the Las Vegas Raiders are the first team in NFL history, this year's Las Vegas Raiders, to blow four double-digit halftime leads in a single season. It's the first team in NFL history to ever do it. So congratulations to Josh McDaniels and the Raiders for that uh, dubious achievement. Patrick Brown says, defense is steady, but the Dolphins 
uh, they, they need a quarterback who can go toe-to-toe with Josh Allen that had their franchise quarterback who deserves better. Derek Carr would galvanize the locker room as well. No question. That's something else I've always talked about with Derek Carr. It's not just the, the talent necessarily. It's not the arm. It's not all that. It's the leadership. It's the, again, like Patrick talked about, the ability to galvanize the locker room. It's, man, last year, it's one of the most impressive things I've ever seen a quarterback do. If it weren't for Joe Burrow taking the worst offensive line in the league to the Super Bowl last year, what Derek Carr did last season was the most impressive thing I'd seen last season. Because to deal with three different controversies within an already dysfunctional organization, to play in one of the toughest divisions in the league, to be at one point six and seven looking dead in the water, and to rally the troops when four straight, it came darn close to beating the eventual AFC champion, Cincinnati Bengals, on the road in that wild card game. Um, now, Derek, Derek Carr is one of the great leaders in the NFL, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, so, yeah, uh, props to him. Like I said, Alfred Parsar Jr. Uh, is going to be on the show in about 15 minutes or so, hopefully. I'm looking forward to get him on. But before we do, I, I want to talk about Shift to the NBA for a second. Uh, <laughs> Luka Doncic was pretty good on Tuesday night. I, I, don't, I don't know if you saw the game. I don't know if you watched the highlights. Look, he even took a two seconds out of your day to look at the box score. Luka Doncic and the Dallas Mavericks faced off in a home game. They played the New York Knicks. <laughs> Poor Knicks, man. The, the Knicks always seem to be in, in these, right in the middle of these big historic games, whether it be at the Garden or whether it be on the road in this case. Luka Doncic, 21 of 31. So he's very efficient. 60 points. 21 rebounds. 10 assists. By the way, he also had a plus minus of plus seven. It is absolutely without a mile the best performance of this season. The question, though, is, is it the greatest performance of all time? Well, somebody would have to really blow me away. To pass Wilt. Because to me, I look, I get it. It was mostly short white guys. There was only eight teams back in the day. The rules were different for Wilt. I get it. The man scored 100 points. Like, I, I can't I can't just look over that just because it was the 60s. Was it March 2nd, 1962? I think it was. I could be wrong on that, but I think it was 1962 or 63, one of those years. Uh, in Hershey, Pennsylvania, Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points. Like that's to me, I don't know if that'll ever be passed. I don't know if I don't know if anybody's ever gonna score a hundred points in my lifetime. And B, I don't know if anyone's gonna put up a a stat line as impressive. I think Kobe's eighty one is 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 number two. Eight eighty one points in the modern era. I get it was against a bad Raptors team. I think they finished like eleventh or twelfth in the East that year. They weren't a good basketball team, but eighty one points is eighty one points. And by the way, Kobe was efficient in that game. I think and Kobe only had 30 something you say only but he had, only had 30 something points of the half and then just went berserk in the second half at what used to be called Staples Center against the Toronto Raptors. Kobe's 81 is number 2 to me. I think this is third. I'm not kidding. I think this is third. Because we know Luka as a triple double type of guy. We know him as a guy who any given night can give you you know, 35, 12, and 11. I mean, last year, he almost, you know, he almost pulled a Westbrook last year, almost averaged a triple-double. Like, that's that's kind of what Luka Doncic does. You think about performances like, I think about a few years ago. I'm not a, I'm not a Westbrook fan. I ain't stretch the imagination, but I cannot lie. That 2020-20 game? I mean, come on now. And by the way, did it. To 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 honor the late great Nipsey Hussle, like it just added a different storyline to it. It was, it, was, it was amazing. 2020, 20, that's amazing. But Luka Doncic again, 60, 20, 10. That's never been done in the history of basketball. Never. Wilt never did it. Like when we talk about 76 year history of the NBA, all the great players, all the great scorers, all of the great do it all type of basketball players. Luca just dropped 60 points, 21 rebounds, and, and 10 assists. We could think about performances like when Clay Thompson, 60 points in 29 minutes. I, I mean, come on now. And with four dribbles, by the way. Got 
sat, you know, Steve Kerr sat him in the fourth quarter because the Warriors were up a million points. If it were a closer game, I'm kind of mad at the Pacers for not, you know, for not making a closer game. Because if so, who knows? Maybe Clay would have threatened Kobe's 81. The way he was shooting the basketball at, at the efficiency, at the rate. Michael Jordan, back in 19, I think it was 1990, 69 points. Uh, was it 18 rebounds, six assists? Similar performance to Luka. Like some of the great performances in, in the history of the league. LeBron almost had it, you know, a 50, was it almost 50 point triple double years ago? So Kobe, 62 points in three quarters. Like there's so many great performances that we can look back to in the history of the NBA. But I'm sorry. And by the way, if you, you look at what, what the Dallas Mavericks pulled off in the fourth quarter, obviously led by Luka, with how much time was left in the game? How much time? 33.2 seconds were left in the game. They trailed by nine. They came back, sent it to overtime, and wound up winning by five points. We talk about the great performances in the history of basketball. I'm sorry. I, I don't know how you can't put Luka no lower than third. It's Wilt's 100, Kobe's 81, and I think Luka's 60, 20, and 10. Westbrook's 20, 20, 20 games impressive. Clay 60 in 29 minutes. Kobe 62 in three quarters. Jordan 69, 18 and six game. There's plenty of great ones, but man, this, this one's up there. By the way, again, had to do in a comeback in a type of comeback that's never, no team in the history of basketball has ever been down nine with 30 seconds left in one. The Mavs did it. So props to the Mavericks, props to Luka Doncic, who to me is a close second in the MVP race to Jason Tatum right now. But, I mean, he was my preseason pick to win the award, so I am absolutely not putting it past him uh, this season. So we've got a special guest joining the show uh, right now. Uh, before we do, before we do, before we do, uh, it is actually our next guest, Rocket Fuel Jets podcast. Devin Booker is a 70-point game once. Yep, did it against the Boston Celtics. Um, only reason I can't put books... Um, 70 point game in that mix is only because they lost the game. I think they lost quite handily uh, to to Boston. But yeah, it's Devin Booker 70 is absolutely in that in, in that category. Uh, I think uh, was it was it Akeem almost had a quadruple double. Uh, there's so many great performances in the history of basketball. But Luca's Luca's is definitely up there. All right, our next guest coming on the show is a teammate of mine on the Grid Network. Uh, look forward to having this guy on for a while. He is a dear, dear friend of mine. Would you please welcome back to Carving It Up Live? <laughs> Alfred Parsar Jr. of the Rocket Fuel Jets podcast. Al, how you doing? Good, Bryson. Good to be back. It is great to have you back. Now, before we get into anything, you've got the new podcast, the Rocket Fuel Jets podcast that you have here uh, on the grid. Talk about your show. Talk about uh, you, you know what what you talk about and, and things of that nature. Uh, pretty much, it's uh, Jets news throughout the week. Uh, I, um, for those of you who listen to the show, I do a, a very nice uh, breakdown of the uh, opposing team's offensive and defensive game plan, and you know, just talk about how the Jets can combat uh, the weapons on the other team. Yeah, and it's you know this season for the Jets has been really really interesting. It's it's, it's you know we we go in the season. I, I think it's safe to say the expectations weren't sky high uh, considering last year. I think you know was it a four win season if I'm not mistaken, having a high pick in the draft. Uh, but your general manager Joe Douglas to say he hit three home runs in the first round of this draft would be an understatement. Um, did a remarkable job. Obviously, you think about other guys like Brees Hall who was you know very much in the race to win Office Rookie of the Year before he went down. Um, and so for the Jets, it's it's a lot of optimism considering the young talent that's that's on this team. What what do you make of the job that Joe Douglas has done over the past couple of years uh, and, and the future of the Jets? We'll get to the quarterback situation later, but just the roster as a whole. Uh, well, well, I like the job Joe Douglas did. And if you look at the um, the the Pepsi uh, Rookie of the Year rankings uh, in the AFC, it's funny because two, two Jets might win, one in each category. Uh, Sauce Gardner has had a great season. Oh. Uh, the guy's playing like he's a fifth-year pro. Yeah. So uh, uh, Sauce Gardner and, and, and is great because I've gotten to see a lot of him uh, up close and personal from the sidelines, which is really cool to, to be there to document that journey. And um, Garrett Wilson has been a, a very big surprise. I, I figured with, you know, Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, Denzel Mims and the other receivers they have at Braxton Berrios. I didn't figure that Garrett Wilson would, would have played such a, a, a integral part of their offense so far. 
So um, I I can't think of any other rookies in the AFC uh, in either category, offense or defense, that that could get those nods. So that that might be history. First time ever you get a a, a pair of rookies, rookie of the years on the same team. Yeah, I don't. I'm ninety percent sure that's never been done that's before. Never it's, happened before. No. It's it's very you know it's very similar to the 2017 Saints because remember they took Marshawn Lattimore, Marcus Williams, yep. Alvin Kamara like they had that really good draft from the top on down. Uh, it, it's it's very similar situation with the Jets. Uh, let's see, I think we've got a comment here from our guy Patrick Brown who's also part of the Grid Network. He said Jets have a nice core of players, just need the franchise QB. Thank you to Patrick for helping me transition into my next question. So that's that is the that's the story surrounding the Jets. We like the coach. I mean, I was a big solid guy when they when they hired him in 2021. Obviously, we think about the defense has been remarkable this year, led by Quentin Williams and Sauce Gardner. It's the, the question has been surrounding the quarterback. And at this rate, I think it's safe to say Zach Wilson's probably played his last game as a Jet. Uh, Mike White has shown flashes this year. Or is he a franchise quarterback? I think there's more to be desired in that regard. But talk about the situation all season long with the Jets. Obviously, Joe Flacco's taking snaps this year as well. Um Talk about the the feel around the organization with Zach Wilson and and just the quarterback situation as a whole. Well, uh, it, it was stated after that horrible and before I even get there, NFL needs to stop these these uh, these Thursday night football games in prime time because they're always horrible. Yeah, but uh, I, I happen to have the the unfortunate mispleasure of being there last Thursday uh, when Trevor Lawrence uh, and the Jaguars carved us up. I like to call it the the field goal classic because that was all the game was was field goals, but um. But after that game, the Jets came out with a press release saying that uh, they're probably going to move on from Zach Wilson after this season, which to me was like, oh, like what, what took you so long? Um, say what you want about Joe Flacco, but I liked him in the first three weeks of the season. Uh, after the first three weeks, he was the NFL uh, 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 leader in, in passing yards those right. first three weeks that, uh, that he played. Then Zach Wilson comes, he gets, he gets hurt, and then uh, they put Mike White in. Mike, only reason Zach Wilson even got to play the last two games because Mike White got hurt with their cartilage and the rib injury. But honestly, I would have never went back to Zach Wilson. We saw uh, Chris Strebler, who uh, was the preseason cult favorite hero uh, amongst Jets fans. He, he moved the ball pretty well, even though uh, a lot of people that I talk to say he's like a poor man's uh, Tim Tebow, uh, the way that he, he operates uh, uh, the game. But I could I would have never went back to Zach Wilson. I'm pretty sure there was some free agent quarterback. I'm pretty sure if they called Cam Newton and said, "Hey, play a game or two for us," he would have he would have signed a contract. Or a couple other guys they could have went to, uh, or even let just let Strebler be the quarterback from the very first um, uh, drive of the game. But Zach Wilson, and it's crazy to me, Bryson, because for those who did watch that game, uh, on the first possession of the game, uh, the the Jets got a strip sack fumble from uh, from Trevor Lawrence. The ball was on the eight-yard line. So they started the drive at, at the Jaguars' eight-yard line, and they didn't move not a not a single inch and got, got a field goal for their only three points of the entire game. If you can't even make something happen from the eight-yard line, the, the, the your defense basically gifted you prime yes. field position and you couldn't move the ball. And it's not like Zach Wilson's a statue. He's a guy who's – we've seen him make things happen with his legs plenty of times. And he couldn't even run the ball himself, let alone pass the ball. It's time. I, I think Joe Douglas, for, for the job that he did in the last draft, his main priority has to be a quarterback this upcoming draft. Has to be. Absolutely. And, you know, I'll, I'll sort of get into the quarterbacks uh, out of this year's draft. And there, there's more to discuss in that regard in, in terms of the lead up to the draft. But it's – it's I've, I've never seen anything like it, Alfred, where, sure, we've had draft busts in the past, but they've shown you the occasional flash. I have never seen a situation where four quarterbacks are used – and it's the young second overall pick who seems completely incapable of moving the ball down the field. Obviously, the second half against the Patriots is going to be, you know, seared into the minds of so many Jets fans, including yourselves, for a long time. But even Strebler, you know, Flacco, you mentioned the first three games, obviously had that big comeback on, on Cleveland back in week two. Uh, Mike White, I think, has been probably the most consistent of the three. Um, it, it's been it, – it, I've never seen anything like it. Can, can you, like, give a – I don't know, comparison of a situation where the, the young gun is ends up being by far the worst and, again, cannot move the ball down the field whatsoever. I can't think of a situation like it. And you look at all four Jets quarterbacks, and they all have different stories. Like you said, Joe Flacco is the 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 mentor who, who's obviously past his prime now, 
but but in his heyday was a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Defeated the 49ers years ago to, to win that Super Bowl. Um, then you have uh Mike White, the guy who the Jets fans love. And if you go to a diehard Jets fan, who do you want to be your quarterback? They're all gonna tell you Mike White. Zach Wilson, of course, the uh, the guy who the front office wanted uh wanted to be the guy. And you got Strebler, who was the uh the cult hero and the uh, the preseason favorite and the the practice squad legend, as they as they've been uh, calling him. So I mean, but I've never I've I've and and you think and you know what's funny? You think of all these quarterbacks who were drafted high at one point, um the the Jamarcus Russells, the the Ryan Leafs, the Tim Couches of the world, and I don't think any of them were this bad. Even, even the Johnny Leaf Manziel's, was pretty bad. I don't, he, Leaf, but, Leaf was pretty bad. Well, Leaf was pretty bad, but at least Tim Couch got the Browns to a to one playoff game. Sure. But you know, like it, it's 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 just mind boggling to me how. But you know what it is? I've never like I and and this is the crazy thing I, I tell Jets fans all the time. We took Zach Wilson, and Justin Fields was available. You you skipped over Justin Fields, who played at Ohio State, and took and mind you, and this is nothing against BYU's football program, but. I always felt that anybody who played at BYU was like the big fish in the little pond. Because right. if you ever look at BYU's conference schedule or the conference they play in, they, they go undefeated almost every season in, in college football, but they don't they don't play anybody competitive. Right. So Zach Wilson looked like a stud in college. Yeah, that's because he was it's, it's like the equivalent of an NFL team against like Pee Wee football. Yeah. In, in, in BYU. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's just mind boggling to me that guys like Justin Fields were available or they could have traded up to get Trevor Lawrence and didn't do it. So, well, it's, it's just, it doesn't make sense to me. And I think they didn't do their due diligence in terms of looking at the other uh, quarterbacks available. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is that it felt like they were zeroed in on Zach Wilson from day one. And they didn't really give anybody else a shot. They didn't, no. they didn't talk to Trey Lance. Like you mentioned, they didn't talk to Justin Fields. It felt like Justin Fields for the, past year leading up to that draft was the clear cut number two behind Trevor Lawrence. And then all of a sudden, you know, you can't hear his name around the jets organization whatsoever. Uh, right. Got a few comments here. Patrick Brown says, Mark Sanchez, Sam Darnold, Zach Wilson. Jets have had a franchise quarterback since Joe Namath. Uh, I'm going to disagree with Patrick only because Mark Sanchez went to two back-to-back -back AFC title games. So that's fair. That's fair. I would get. I would. Uh, we had a couple of franchise quarterbacks: Vinny Testaverde, Chad Pennington. I. I wouldn't say we haven't had any since Namath, but I mean the list is slim, though. But it is. I wouldn't. I wouldn't group Sanchez with Darnold and Wilson. At least Sanchez saw postseason football. He did. He's the last Jets quarterback. The to last see Jets quarterback. Football. Yeah. The so last, the last one. Yep. There you go. And uh, Patrick Brown also says that the Jets could go redraft Trey Lance or Justin Fields will be the pick. I think it's safe to say. And I, I love Trey Lance out of the draft, but we barely seen the kid play due to injuries and, and other factors. Now, Robert Sala, what's – again, I really like the, the Robert Sala hire. I thought he was a really good defensive coordinator in San Francisco. Yep. And we could argue it's the Kyle Shannon system. you got a lot of talent over there. But it, it feels like he's kind of built the culture in his image through the first two years in New York. Talk about sort of the feel around the fan base, the feel around the franchise with Robert Sala. Is it pretty much guaranteed he's, he's going to be the guy next year and not have any sort of worry about being on the hot seat, possibly? Well, I, I would hope he's not on the hot seat from talking to Jets fans and even me, myself, working for the team. Um, the, the vibe about Coach Sala is he's a, he's a good guy. He handles the media very well. He, he knows the right answers to questions when he goes into the media scrums and the pressers. So, um, and you know what it is? He took the job last season, and everybody knew last season we were in a good team. So nobody held the four-win season against him because he didn't have much to work with. I even think he exceeded expectations this season because, let's let's face it, the Jets are, are two wins away from clinching a playoff spot. Nobody, and I mean nobody, not even myself, thought that the Jets would even could still have something to play for by by this point in the season this year. No, no, no absolutely not. Especially, you know, there was a point in the season, what were they, what were they, seven and five, I think? Seven so, and five, yeah. Seven and five, at least. I mean, for there was a, a half second there where they weren't, they weren't totally out of the AFC East mix. Now, obviously, Buffalo is the superior team in the division over everybody. But um, just being competitive, they obviously beat Buffalo, ironically, with Zach Wilson on a game-winning drive, of all things, if, if you could, you know, believe that. So, I mean, look, would you 
Would you call this season, let's just say for the sake of argument, the Jets split their last two games, they finish 8-9. and nine. Or even if they win their last two, finish 9-8, and eight, but still they don't get in the playoffs because Miami, Miami wins one more. Um, would you call this year a successful season for the Jets by considering the standards we had for them going into 2022? I would say there's a lot of moral victories in this season. Um, again, I personally, uh, on one, um, when I was on our, our good friend Barry's uh, All Even show, uh, he asked me about the Jets, and I said, I don't expect more than five wins out of this team. They've already I- exceeded that. Um, like I said, it was the rookies. It's, it's the Sauce Gardeners and the – well, even though Brees went down early and and the Garrett Wilsons, I didn't think either of those guys would have made as big of a splash. Maybe Sauce, but but not Garrett Wilson to make as big of a splash as they did. Um, this defense, for, for a defense that, for most of them, this is their, their first year together because Quan Alexander and DJ Reader knew. Um, right. I didn't think that they, I didn't think the defense, I mean, Jet, and historically Jets defense has always been good, but Quinnen and Quincy Williams and Sheldon Rankins and CJ Mosley and all those guys, they really stepped it up this year. Like uh, for real, for real. So I'm, 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 I'm very, I'm very pleased with the progress we made this year. So I, even if we don't make the playoffs this year was a, was a step in the, in the right direction by far. Absolutely. And again, it feels like, you know, to win a Super Bowl, I think you have to be at least good in two of the three major departments, that being GM, head coach, and quarterback. Feels like you've got at least two yeah. um, uh, you know, in that situation. I love Douglas, and I really like Sala, the quarterback, obviously. We'll see if it's, you know, just a few more questions, sort of piggyback off my first segment. What are the chances that you think Derek Carr ends up in a Jets uniform? I don't see it happening, okay. but... If it did happen, I would welcome it with open arms only because Derek Carr is a quarterback that's been to the playoffs. None of our quarterbacks in the last couple of years have, have seen postseason. So I, I, he would be a welcomed addition. He, he's a is a veteran with a lot of experience. Um, And I, and I just think that – I mean, I know I run a Jets show, but I think that he's getting a raw deal in in, uh, in Vegas. I don't think he that he should be benched for, for Jared Stidham, so – uh, that's just my opinion, but maybe his time in, uh, in Vegas is over, so you never know. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to the Jets going to acquire him. I, and I feel, hey, if they go ahead and get this guy, we shouldn't have to draft a quarterback in the draft because we still have Mike. We'll still have, Mike White will probably still be the backup to whoever it is next year if he's right. not the starter. So, absolutely, and and I could even see a situation maybe where. You draft a young quarterback, but Mike White's the guy just because he's got experience. He's seen, you know, NFL action and trying to ease ease the rookie into that role. Again, depending on which rookie you take. If you take maybe like an older guy, like my my guy Hendon Hooker, if if he's healthy by that point in the season, um, because he's older, it's kind of like a Joe Burrow in 2020 or even Kenny Pickett last year, where it's like, you know, you're 22, 23 years old. You got a lot of college starts. Like you should be ready uh, right off the bat, as, as opposed to say, like a young guy like Trey Lance who just needs reps in practice. Now, a couple of, of non-Jets questions. So, the NFL MVP race is really fascinating this year. Um, I'm I'm giving Mahomes uh, sort of the, the minute of the doubt because the argument I've made even all season long when Jalen Hurts was healthy was Hurts got A.J. Brown, Mahomes lost Tyreek Hill, and yet Mahomes is first in basically every quarterback stat that matters. Yards, touchdowns, QBR, all of them. Um I can hear the argument for Jalen Hurts. I think even Joe Burrow. Let's not let's not take Joe Burrow out of the MVP mix just yet. If you had a vote today, who would be your MVP? Vote goes to Mahomes, and uh, I, I I agree more uh, with what you're saying because you think about it. Outside of Travis Kelsey, he doesn't have a consistent wide. Re- Basically, he has no consistent wide receiver target, and he doesn't have a, a solid running back either. You look at right. that. Uh, you look at that running back situation that he has. Uh, Edwards, Hilaire, or Pacheco, neither of them are are really reliable. And then you look at you look at the wide receivers they have. They have uh, Juju Smith Schuster. Uh, they have Kadarius Tony, who they got from the Giants. So uh, you know, and then none of them are putting up big wide. Well, Juju start midway through the season started to pick up pace, but he's not the same Juju Smith Schuster that set the world on fire with the Steelers. So um, other than Travis Kelsey, he doesesn't really have a you know, and and Miko Hard, Hard Miko Hardman and uh, Mar, uh, Valdez Scantling, they're not. You know, they're not. None of them can be Tyree Kill. Oh. So to so to so to lose a, a talent like Tyree Kill, who's a generation once in a generation talent, to go to go to this group of guys and still put up the same or better numbers is very astounding. So I got to give Pat Mahomes uh, a lot of credit there. 
And like you said, Jalen Hurts, while, yes, he's having a fantastic season, at the same time, he has a Devonta Smith and uh, A.J. Brown. So, you know, I got to give the credit to Mahomes. Playoff team and uh, and with less weapons. Yeah, I would ag- I agree as well. And again, I, I think I'm going more towards... Well, even if you want to take the V word valuable out of it, you know, again, just statistically, Mahomes has been the better guy, by the way, in the tougher conference as well. Um, yep. but, but I mean, I, I think I, I hate that the injury is kind of taking Jalen Hurts out of the mix. I really want to see him finish the year, see, you know, you know, what he ended up finishing with with a full 17 game slate. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think you're right. And I agree with you. And then the last question I around this time of year, I always ask my guests this question. So we all have our preseason predictions. I, for one, picked the Broncos to face the Rams in this year's Super Bowl. I was about as as a, a way off as a Zach Wilson slant. But <laughs> today, Alfred Parsar Jr., the host of the Rocket Fuel Jets podcast, who is your favorites to come out of the AFC and the NFC today? Oh, well, I think the Buffalo Bills get to the Super Bowl this season. Okay. And I think out of the NFC, I know everybody is uh, jumping up and down on the uh, on the Eagles, but with Jalen Hurts' injury, I think that uh, America's team will make it to the big game. Wow. Yeah, I think I think the, I think the Cowboys make it to the big game only because Hurts. We, we don't know. Uh, I think the I think the Eagles know more than they're letting on about his injury, and obviously he's going to tough it out when the playoffs come, but. You know, uh, a hurt Jalen Hurts. Nobody knows what that's going to look like yet. Uh, Brady, they're going to win their division only because the NFC South should be renamed the NFC Stinks. Um, so br- I don't think Brady is, is even getting past the first round uh, the way that the Bucks have looked. I don't know. And then the rest of the field in the, uh, in the NFC, if the Packers hold on and make it, I don't think they're a threat. I don't think Kirk Cousins can step up uh, when the light when the lights are bright. Um, yeah, so I, I, I see the Cowboys. I think that this year will finally be their year to get to the big game. And, uh, if they had to play the bills, I think the bills win that one. So okay. I, I'm, I'm I, even though they're a division rival, you heard it here first, Buffalo bills will, will win the super bowl this year. But you're the second person to come on the show and say the Cowboys will win the NFC. That's, that's really, everybody's higher on Dallas than I am. Cause, cause sort of my takeaway is that may, maybe there's a little, a little bit bias involved cause I'm a, a Dak fan, but you know, the defense has been down this year. The offensive line has not played up to par. And I've said, if Dak has to play like he did like last Saturday against Philly, I'm not sure you sh- sure you get out of the second round just because, I mean, don't, don't forget about my man sturdy Brock Purdy in, in San Francisco with that defense. I, I think they're still a threat as well, but there, listen, this playoffs, Alfred, is going to be as fun as we've had, uh, considering the we have questions about just about everybody, pretty much except Kansas City. Outside yeah. of the Chiefs, we don't know anything about anybody um, in, in terms of whether they can step up to the plate. Uh, it, it, it's going to be fun for well, sure. Well, I don't, I don't, outside of, well, if Josh Allen could overcome that UCL injury, I don't think the Chiefs, yeah. the Bills have it. The, the only knock on the Bills is how will the defense look now that Von Miller won't be there. Right. Yep, that that's the only and and so far since he's been gone, they they pretty much look the same. So my yeah. my only thing is the NFC, I because you know the NFC is so crowded as far as who's on the bubble and who's in, and who's out. Because who knows? This time three weeks from now, we could have every team in the um in the NFC East in the playoffs. Sure, absolutely. And uh, the way that the Giants and the Commanders have been streaky lately. Who knows which 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 Giants or Commanders team is going to show up once the postseason comes about? It'd be interesting if you got an upset or two in there. To just to, depending on matchups, it's like I said, it, it's going to be good. Alfred, before we get out of here, tell people where they can find your show. Uh so the show is on uh, YouTube. It's on two places. The it's on the Grid, the Grid's YouTube, and then of course Rocket Fuel NYJ, and then we're on Instagram and Twitter, uh, Rocket Fuel underscore NYJ. Uh, where we'll be talking uh, all a whole bunch of Jets uh, news coverage. And uh, in game analysis, Alfred Parser Jr. Love having you on, man. Love uh, talking Jets with you and just talking NFL and talking life with you, bro. I appreciate it. Uh, of course. Glad to be here. All right. Have a good one. I was Alfred Parser Jr. of the Rocket Fuel Jets podcast, uh, where you can get all content Jets related. And, and really, you, you need to check out, he was talking about earlier, his game plan breakdowns. I remember, was it Jets, Steelers, I think it was? Uh, I remember that show where he was really just you know, dive in the X's and O's uh, situation in terms of what the Chiefs, or sorry, what the Jets want to do, what the Steelers want to do. Um, 
Great, great show. Please check it out right here on The Grid or on a Rocket Fuel YouTube channel. Subscribe to both. And, uh, yeah, great guests. Love having him on. And, listen, there, there's 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 more reason to be optimistic than not if you're the New York Jets. But his uh, his Super Bowl pick would be really interesting. Dallas Buffalo. That would be that would be really interesting. You know, Josh Allen's never won a ring. Or he's, forget that. He's never been to a Super Bowl. I mean, Joe Burrow's never won, but he's he's gotten there. He came close with a... A roster that did not stack up terribly well against the Los Angeles Rams, at least pre-Odell injury. Um, and then you got Dallas, all the storylines that would surround that, getting back to the Super Bowl for the first time since 95. Uh, for the Bills, that'd be the first time since 93? No, 90, 94, right? No, 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 90, it'd be 93, right, because they got to four straight Super Bowls. And... Sorry to remind you, Bills Mafia, because that's one of my favorite fan bases in sports, but they lost They lost all four. And by the way, all of them, the NFC East teams, Giants, Cowboys, Washington. Mm, that's So listen, if, it, if it's not a Dak Prescott ring, then there is, if that's not what we get, then there is no team in the NFL. I want to see win a Super Bowl more than the Buffalo Bills. Don't necessarily mean I'm picking them, but I would, for that fan base, I'd love to, I, for for, the, for their sake, what they've been through. I'd love to see them get that. There's, they're one of the best fan bases in sports. I mean, like, how, what fan base? I didn't know I was doing a Bills Mafia a segment today, especially when I just had a Jets fan on. But what fan base when a quarterback gets a win for uh, say the Bills need help somewhere? If a quarterback gets a win against a team that the, the Bills needed to lose, they always donate to his charity. They did to Andy for Andy Dalton years ago when they broke that long playoff drought. Uh, they've done to other quarterbacks in the past. So, yeah, yeah. Bills Mafia is the absolute best. I, I, I love those people. Now, let's let's move on, though, we're sticking the AFC East. So just talk to Alfred of the Rocky Field Jets podcast. Again, go subscribe to the Rocky Field Jets podcast YouTube channel and the Grid Network where you can listen to his shows in both destinations, or on both destinations, rather. Uh, let's then just talk about Bill's Mafia. Let's talk about the Miami Dolphins in kind of a serious situation. So Tua Tungvaluwa was concussed in the third quarter of the Dolphins' loss to the Green Bay Packers this past Sunday. And uh, he's in concussion protocol. Mike McDaniel, the head coach, has already ruled him out for this Sunday's game against the New England Patriots. Now, for Miami, it's going to be Teddy Bridgewater. And I've always said this about Teddy. Teddy's in that low-end starter, high-end backup group. I've always said, if, if Teddy is your backup, you're in good. It's like Gardner Minshew. It's like Andy Dalton. It's like having one of those guys, Colt McCoy. If you put him in the right situation with the right pieces, he can win you a couple games. You know, he, he you know, not going to blow you away necessarily in the, in the, in the box score, although he could Teddy Bridgewater. I think he made a pro bowl, if I'm not mistaken, all the way back in 2015. I know that was a long time ago, but you know, T Teddy's a, a solid quarterback. Dolphins can still make the playoffs with Teddy. So I think they'll be fine on Sunday. I don't two is better, but I don't think the gap is huge between Tua and Teddy Bridgewater. And Mike McDaniel's a great coach. So they'll, uh, I think they'll beat New England, but we'll see what happens on Sunday. As for Tua, there's kind of been, obviously, we all know about the the concussions in, I think, my view and the view of most people. Unofficially, but we have eyes. We, you know, we could see what happened. The two concussions back-to-back -back in a five-day span back in week three and week four against the Buffalo Bills and then against the Cincinnati Bengals, obviously the second one being as, as scary of an injury as we've ever seen with you know, the way Tua's body reacted to the injury and the trauma. Um, he missed a few weeks, came back against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, but the question for Tua is, should he play? Should he play the rest of the season? Dolphins are eight and seven. They win one more game. They're pretty much locked into a playoff spot. If I'm Tua, I'm at least sitting out the regular season. And then I'm looking at, okay, say the Dolphins split their last two, they go nine and eight. They're the seven seed. They would face either, they could face any of the three Kansas City, Cincinnati, or Buffalo. There's a very good chance Miami will get blown out in all three of those matchups. My thing is to uh, health wise and reputation wise, I have way more to lose than I have to gain. Many looked at the Miami Dolphins five weeks ago as Super Bowl contenders. I never did. But certainly now, I we could see Miami, just because the weapons they have with Mike McDaniel, maybe stealing a playoff, maybe. 
a bit like they'd have to have some injuries uh, for the other side. They'd have to have maybe a officiating break, a bounce going their favor, something wild. It's the playoffs. It's anything can happen. It's 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 one game to decide who advances. But for the Dolphins, I'm just not sure that they can they can survive. Forget round one. I, I highly doubt that they could finish in the final two and get to the AFC Championship game in an AFC that is just stacked. So for Tua, and it's not bailing on your team, by the way, but the risk of, God forbid, four concussions in a season? Man, that's... Man, I, I, don't, I don't know if the risk is, is worth that. The thought process for Tua maybe changes. Let's say the Dolphins were a 12-win team, like the number one seed. They get a first-round buy, so another, like another week for Tua to rest. Maybe a situation like that. Maybe that would fa- uh, that that would factor in and change the thinking if they were a team like say say think look about the look at the NFC. Look at another former Alabama quarterback. Say it was Philadelphia, right? You know, if if if, if Jalen Hurts were you know knock on wood for Jalen, hope he gets better off that shoulder injury. If Jalen Hurts was in the same situation, say he had a concussion, but Philly could rest in the last two weeks, just like they're doing possibly with the shoulder injury, get a week off, then play in the playoffs. It's time for him to recover and. Man, you don't get a lot of chances to win the Super Bowl. That ultimately comes down to Jalen. Like, to me, that comes down to his decision and obviously the medical staff. But once the medical staff clears him, then it becomes Jalen's decision. For Tua, he has, once again, way more to lose than to gain. And by the way, folks, the Dolphins as well got to be looking at this and saying, man, what do we have to gain by playing him? What do we have to gain? Because you had the whole investigation after the Cincinnati Bengals game. The Dolphins were ripped. Mike McDaniels ripped. The NFL was ripped for their uh, in the, the concussion spotters, everything in between. Some people were fired because of it. The Dolphins got to be looking at this and saying, if this guy, if his head slams against that turf again, or if somebody comes in and hits him in a, in a sensitive spot in the head, the, the backlash, folks are getting suspended if that happens. So, if I'm Tua, obviously he's not allowed to play this week. He's already been ruled out by his coach this week, so we can't play. I can't play in Week 18, and I'm I'm not so sure I play in the wild card. It gets the playoffs. It's exciting. Miami hasn't been in the playoffs since 2016. I'll understand the the. Uh, the adrenaline that comes from that, win or go home, every game's a game seven. Man, you got to be careful. And with the Dolphins as well, from a PR standpoint, I'm not sure I play Tua. Because if I'm, I'm Miami, let's say he comes back week 18, wins, plays well, whatever, comes to the wild card game. Say they say they play the Kansas City Chiefs. Let's just throw that team out there because they're the two seed currently. Let's say they go to Arrowhead. A lot of people could be watching that game. It's Mahomes. It's Andy Reid. It's Arrowhead. It's you know a great environment. It's the playoffs. Here we go. And Tua gets concussed again. And the loudest stadium, the NFL Arrowhead Stadium, is as quiet as Cincinnati was back in Week Four. And the whole world is tweeting, watching. You know those that feel so inclined, praying. Man, Tua is a loser in this situation should he play, and God forbid something happens, the Dolphins would be a loser, and Roger Goodell. Let me tell you something. Goodell, as any commissioner does, very much cares about the public perception of the NFL. Remember the NFL dealt with a similar situation when the whole CTE thing came up, when the Will Smith concussion movie came out. All, th- all these things that was happening around like 2015, 2016 or so. Man, the NFL was fighting a PR battle every day, it felt like. You know, you had uh, um, you know, you had mothers being like, yeah, I don't know if my kids should play football. Should you just play basketball or baseball? Safer sports where he can still make a lot of money if he's good enough. If not just that, a game where he can have fun, play, get you know, a great uh, physical exercise, but not be at risk of head trauma. It's 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 a layered discussion. It's one that I don't think any of us are qualified to make that decision for Tua or for the Dolphins or for the league. I'm just saying if I were in Tua's position, my next NFL game will be in 2023 and it won't be a playoff game. 
My next NFL game will be in September of 2023. But I, I'm not risking it. There's there's no way. There's no way. This I I, I it's 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 too big of a risk. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Patrick Brown, you'll never forgive yourself for picking LA Rams versus Denver in the Super Bowl. No, I won't. I won't. It's the worst pick I've ever made in carving up history. This show's been around. It's not been around that long. It's been around about three years and two months. It's the worst pick I've ever made in the history of the show. It's, it's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. It's, it, 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 it's still, it still leaves a, a sore spot, uh, in, in, in my soul. It, it really does. So, yeah, it's, no, no. Let's move on. I've tried to talk as little Lakers as possible this year because I get the Lakers. It's it's LeBron. It's we all understand they have the sixth worst record in the NBA. They're eleven fifteen. They're they're a bad basketball team. That's to be expected. Although I did say that they would uh, make the playoffs this year. I said they'd be the eighth seed and lose to my Warriors in the first round. Um, but they lost last night to the Miami Heat. And LeBron James was talking after the game and made it pretty darn clear about where he stands uh, with the Lakers organization. Take a listen. I don't want to finish my career, uh, you know, playing at this level uh, from a team aspect. Uh, I must still be able to compete for championships because I I know what I can still bring to any ball club um, with the right pieces. Um, I think about... um, you know, my son graduating high school soon and going off to college, and I'm still playing. And I'm, my youngest son is a junior next year. And how much more time I'll miss? Um, so, throughout the course of uh, a day to the weeks to the months, think about a little bit of everything. Um, you know, think about how much of the world I'm gonna see when I'm done playing the game. But um, at the end of the day, I keep the main thing the main thing. And every day when it's time for us to work, I lock in. So. LeBron's obviously sitting back and saying, okay, I'm in year 20. Tomorrow, happy early birthday, LeBron James. Tomorrow is his 38th birthday. He's been in the NBA longer in his lifetime than he hasn't been. And so this is kind of the first time that I've heard LeBron kind of talk about his mortality in in basketball terms. Talk about, hey, you know, I, I, I don't have, I'm on the back half of my career. I'm in the twilight of my career. Which, by the way, can I just say, you know, I've always said I think Jordan's the GOAT, but I've, I've, I've always, always been consistent on this. LeBron will very much have a case. And I I, you know, I heard somebody the other day, it might have been Dirk Nowitzki, uh, and Shaq has said this as well. When LeBron this season passes Kareem for the all-time scoring record, how many more arguments will you have for Jordan? There's plenty. Jordan's, if Jordan's not the best, he's number two. Okay, like it's, it's Jordan, LeBron, and I think there's a, a pretty solid gap between those two and the third best player who I think is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Point being, There's no player in the history of basketball. There's few athletes in the history of sports that this late in their career, they're still this dominant. LeBron James' last nine games, he's averaged 32-7-7 on 57% shooting. The problem with that is, on the court, in that span, the Lakers are plus 60. When he's off the court, they're minus 59. So essentially, all the work that LeBron puts on the court is negated as soon as he's out of the game. And you know, LeBron has kind of said, like, basically, man, I'm tired of losing. We saw the other day he deleted that tweet from late last season when he said, I vow to never miss the playoffs again. I don't think, it, and by the way, I don't think that was a great look for LeBron. It generates more attention. I think it was probably a mistake on his part and, you know, Maverick Carter, whoever was a part of that, because we're talking about it more now that has been deleted than when it was tweeted. But that aside, I don't, I've never seen anything like this with, with LeBron James and considering he's had four stops his NBA career. Cleveland, Miami, a second stint in Cleveland now with, with, in LA with the Lakers. And all three teams have put LeBron James in position at one point or another to win a championship. In Miami, it was right off the bat. Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, a lot of veterans. Uh, some of the young guys contributed. They built a team around LeBron James. They had shooters. They had rim protectors. 
all the guys that fit a skill set. Every single year, LeBron James was Miami. All four, they had a chance to win the championship. They had a, or they, they had at least had a championship level roster. In Cleveland, at least two of those four years, 2016, which in which they won it, 2017, in which they fell to the greatest team ever, the 2017 Warriors, they had the team to do it. They put the pieces around LeBron to compete for a championship. Now, his first year in Cleveland, he dragged them to the finals, especially once Kyrie went down, when Kevin Love went down. His last year in Cleveland dragged them to the finals. I mean, his second best player in the Eastern Conference Finals against the Boston Celtics was Jeff Green. Now, Jeff Green's a nice NBA player. I like him a lot. But if he's the second best player on a team in the Eastern Conference Finals, you should get swept. Now, LeBron beat the baby Celtics and got to the NBA Finals. This is LeBron's fifth year in Los Angeles. Fifth year. Out of those five years, once have they been legitimate title contenders. The first year, there's a lot of weird pieces. You had young guys, but you also had veterans. Obviously, Brandon Ingram was still there, Alonzo Ball, Josh, Josh Hart. You had the veterans, JaVale McGee, Lance Stevenson, Rajon Rondo. It was kind of a weird fit. And so they retooled the roster in 2019. Brought in some veterans. Brought in Jeff Green. Obviously, Anthony Davis was, was the big fish. They bring him in. A lot of other pieces. Won a championship. The year after, you had a lot of injuries. Uh, brought in guys like Dennis Schroeder, and were the seventh seed. The next year, obviously the Westbrook trade, which LeBron had something to do with that. They missed the playoffs. This year, they're what, the 13th seed? 12th, 13th seed in the West? The I talked about the Raiders in my first segment on the show about how they don't get enough credit for how much of a train wreck that they have been. I've said the same thing about the Lakers ever since the passing of Dr. Jerry Buss. They've had one great year. 2020, which props to them, their great year, they won the championship. Hats off to them. They, they got it done in the bubble. Everybody wants to put an asterisk next to it, to which I always say everybody else was in the same bubble. Like, let's, let's, let's not take credit away just because it's LeBron James. But they were great. Every other year since, they've either sucked or been really average. Most of those years, they've sucked. Despite having, albeit back half of his career, but Kobe Bryant and then LeBron James. Not to mention, by the way, a lot of good young talent in that span. They had Brandon Ingram, who went on to be an all-star in New Orleans. They had Lonzo Ball, who up until this latest injury was doing really good things with the Pelicans and with the Bulls. Julius Randle, probably in line for another all-star season with the Knicks. D'Angelo Russell made an all-star team after he left the Lakers in Brooklyn. Plenty of young talent. Jeannie Buss, Rob Palenka, it's been a mess. They've done a bad job. They refuse to move off of Anthony Davis. Just cross their fingers, maybe he'll be healthy. And we saw a stretch in November where Anthony Davis looked like the best player in the league, which he's fully capable of being. The problem is he is AD, which doesn't stand for Anthony Davis. It stands for, as I say, always down. The dude is made of glass. And where are we at now? He's out indefinitely. What a shock. When you refuse to surround an all-time great like LeBron James, who's still... If he's not in his prime, bare minimum, he's a top 10 player in the league. I think he's around six or seven. I don't think he's top five anymore. But can you win a championship with LeBron as your best player? Uh, you darn skip, you can. How about this? Go to Boston. If you swapped Jason Tatum with LeBron James, does it give the Celtics a less chance to win the championship? No, actually, in the eyes of some, it gives them a greater chance. And I love, by the way, I love Jason Tatum. This is not taking any, this is not to throw strays at the guy who I think is the lead league candidate at this point for MVP. I love Jason Tatum. But drop LeBron, drop LeBron, by the way, on some eh, teams. Let's let's put LeBron James on the Minnesota Timberwolves. All of a sudden, we're like, hey, that maybe they they could win a playoff series. They have a disappointing year this year in large part because they made a st- Stupid trade to go get Rudy Gobert, which at the time I said was stupid. Now it's looking even worse. But 
if you think about all 30 teams in the NBA, put LeBron on all of them, I'm not so sure they wouldn't all be better than the Lakers are now with LeBron. I mean, folks, they have the sixth worst record in basketball. Can't do much worse than that. So I get why LeBron's frustrated. And listen, you can be as critical of him as you want, and I have on the Westbrook move. That was LeBron's call. That was Clutch Sports' call. But let's also be consistent and say he didn't want Frank Vogel. He wanted Ty Lue. And when the Lakers interviewed Ty Lue, they said, you can have the job, but we're picking your staff. The Clippers brought him as an, as an assistant, fired Doc Rivers the next year, gave him the job and say, you can pick your own staff. That was the difference. The Lakers run this, run, run their business like a mom and pop shop. In that, and it's just like the Cowboys. There's so many similarities between the Lakers and the Cowboys. It's not even funny. In which everybody surrounding the organization was at one point affiliated with the Lakers. At some point, you got to bring in some outside sources. At some point, you need to bring in smart people from other places who aren't going to be blinded by the 17 banners or the purple and gold. Listen, the Lakers are the gold, historically, the gold standard of the NBA. The Lakers have had more great players than any franchise in the history of basketball, and it's not that close. Boston second, it's, it's, it's not that close. But we can't be blinded by that and say, just because we got LeBron James, he should be able to take us. It's like LeBron needs help too. LeBron's not the 2018 version of, of himself where you could put him on basically any team in the league and he could get you to the finals, so long as he didn't run into the Warriors. Like, put LeBron on any team in the East, they're getting to the finals in 2018. Because that was, in my opinion, that might have been the greatest year of his career. Just give him what he had to, uh, what he had to overcome in Cleveland. I get why LeBron's frustrated. I really do. He's like, man, I'm doing my part. I am. And, I mean, I'm looking at Rob Polinka like, you, you're not going to make a move for a Buddy Heald or a Miles Turner or, dare I say, bring back Kyle Kuzma. Look what Kuzma's doing with the Wizards. No, they're just, they're getting everybody else's rejects. By the way, they let Alex Caruso go a couple of years ago. Basically, wherever, if there's talent in L.A., which I'm sure there's some talented players outside of LeBron and AD in L.A., we just don't know about it. But when they go elsewhere, man, they kick butt. They really do. Yeah, LeBron has every right to be frustrated. Five years with the Lakers, they've been in title contention once. Cleveland could do better than that. Cleveland. Miami was in contention every single year he was there. Why? Because Miami is one of the best organizations in the league. It goes back to what I've said for a while. We've got to stop looking at the Lakers currently. Historically, that's a different conversation, but currently as one of the gold standards in the league because they're not. Jeannie Buss, I believe after Robert Sarver just sold the Phoenix Suns, I think I read the other day, Jeannie Buss is the poorest owner in the NBA. Rob Palenka, it might be the worst general manager in the NBA, and the man got an extension. Been saying this for a while. It's very Dallas Cowboys-ish. So, this is a, it's a disaster. Patrick Brown, who I believe is a Lakers fan, he says, LeBron James sent a message to Rob Plink and Jeannie Buss. The statement Rob released today didn't sound sincere. Uh, I have not seen Palinka's uh, statement since LeBron uh, made these comments last night after the loss to Miami. But, uh, but yeah, you're right, Patrick. It absolutely was a message towards uh, Jeannie and, and Rob and the front office as a whole. It's, 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 a, it's a disaster. There's, there's, there's nothing you can do to sugarcoat how bad the Lakers have blown this. Having, again, <laughs> arguably the greatest basketball player ever. And not when he's in the last like year of his career and he's averaging 15 points a game. No, 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 no. Last nine games, he's averaged 32-7-7 on 57% shooting. He's the, the man's doing everything he can. He's in year 20. He's still, you've got a top 10 player in the world. And you're awful. 
You're bad defensively, situationally, the Lakers. And again, Darvin Ham thus far hasn't seemed to be that big of an upgrade over Frank Vogel. Uh, and I liked Darvin Ham, but I, I said when Frank Vogel was hi- fired, I was like, guys, Vogel's not the problem. Is he a great coach? No, but he was there when y'all won the championship. Couldn't have been that bad, that year at least. He has he leaves much to be desired, but he got a lot of Pacers teams to the Eastern Conference Finals every year. Pacers teams that weren't stacked took the LeBron-led heat to seven games one time. Like, let's... But they used him as a scapegoat. Right? It's, 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 it's what they do. And so, Lakers will... We'll see what they do if they if they make any deals at the deadline. They have some nice players, Austin Reeves. Westbrook's been good off the bench. But when you bring in guys like Patrick Beverly and Thomas Bryan and former Warrior, former champion with the Warriors, I don't want to be too hard on him, but Damian Jones, I can't take you all that seriously. I get why LeBron's frustrated. Especially when he looks around the league and he's like, "Man, these these other stars, you're, these other organizations put stars around around them. Why? Why? I'm LeBron James. Why can't y'all put stars around me?" It's a fair question. But no, the, the, this this NBA season has been really really interesting because in terms of who we thought would be good, it's 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 pretty much been what what we thought. We knew Milwaukee was going to be really good. I wasn't a, quite as high on Boston as everybody else was, because I thought the Udoka thing would be a a big uh, loss for them. But give credit to Joe Mazzula. He's done a great job uh, as the interim head coach uh, of that team um, this season. So, yeah, it's it's without question been a a great year for Boston. Again, I think Jason Tatum today would be my favorite to win MVP. Um, But, you know, we'll we'll see what happens. Luka still is, you know, Luca the other night knocked at the door and said, uh, "Hang on a minute, don't, don't, don't forget about me. I'm, I'm still, I'm still here. I'm still here. He, he's very much in that race. And Joel Embiid is as well too. Patrick Brown, Danny Green, KCP, Markeith Morris, Rondo, and Dwight Howard were key pieces to the 2020 title. Should have kept them together and ran it back, but yeah, the Dwight Howard went to Philly. I think he came back to the Lakers, but that was an older Dwight Howard. They let Rondo go to." Atlanta, he got traded to the Clippers, didn't play much after that. Uh, and then they brought him back to the team when he was two years older. Markeith Morris, uh, Casey, why they traded KCP is, 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 Guy is one of the best three and D players in the league. He, he, he is. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's got great length in the defensive side of the floor. Really good knockdown shooter. Like he's, he's perfect for LeBron. They let him go. Danny Green, great spot up shooter. They let him walk. It's the Lakers' way, apparently. I didn't know the standard was uh, fighting to get in a play-in spot for an organization that's won or, or tied with the Celtics for the record with 17 championships, but hey, who knows? Standards change, I guess. All right, Week 17 kicks off tonight in Nashville, Tennessee. By the way, may I say, one of the best cities in America. Beautiful, beautiful town. Um, I think it's one of the highest-growing cities in America as well. I, I love Nashville. But their team, the Tennessee Titans, will be hosting the Dallas Cowboys tonight. Uh, So let's go ahead and get the music on right now. Big, big favorites on the road. Minus 13 and a half. I'm looking at the other lines this week. That is just by a little bit outside of Kansas City being favored over Denver. That is the biggest favorite that we'll have this week in week 17. And certainly they have a case uh, for just that. Look, Tennessee is Tennessee's injury report is is wild. Okay, Tannehill, they've already announced he's done for the season. Taylor Lewan's down. Derrick Henry is already, uh, or just a few minutes ago, got, got announced by Adam Schefter that he's he's been listed inactive. Malik Willis is even, uh, that they're, they're giving him the week off. Because for Tennessee, the game means absolutely nothing. Because if they lose 1,000 to nothing, if they win 1,000 to nothing, it puts them no closer or no, much, or it doesn't put them closer or further away from making the playoffs as the AFC South champion. Because they're locked in with a tie with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Both are 7-8. and eight. So this game for both teams means nothing. But you go into week 18, they'll face off for the division. We'll see what happens a week from now. But for Tennessee, and this is going to be such a conflict of interest for me because you guys know I'm a Dak fan. I'm not a Cowboys fan anymore, but I'm still a Dak Prescott fan, so I root for whoever Dak Prescott's playing for at the moment. It happens to be the Cowboys right now to win. 
It's be a conflict of interest for me, though. Because starting for the Tennessee Titans, making the first start of his NFL career is my man out of the University of Tennessee, Joshua Dobbs. Uh, Josh Dobbs was in Tennessee, spent four years there from 2013 to 2016. Uh Obviously, is most famous, I believe, for the I call it the Dob Nail Boot. It's a playoff of uh, a legendary play Georgia did against Tennessee. Don't have enough time to get into it, but the Hail Mary from 2016. He was the first Tennessee quarterback since 04 to beat Florida, and in that streak, Duck pulling the truck. Am I right? Uh, but it was a great playmaker there. Great with his legs, made all the big plays when he needed to. Um, problem was he was he was wasted by a uh, head coach Butch Jones. Point being. He'll be starting his first NFL game tonight. This is his eighth day as a Tennessee Titan. So this would be, if if the Titans pull this off, for Josh Dobbs, it would be barely short of what Baker Mayfield did a couple weeks ago against the Raiders, being in Vegas for, or, I'm sorry, being in LA for 48 hours, coming in relief and winning the game. So this could be Dobbs tonight. Here's what I will tell you from my experience of watching this guy. He leaves some things to be desired as in terms of a precision passer, but he's got a really good arm, and dude is an absolute playmaker with his legs. I saw some highlights of the preseason when he was in Cleveland with Pittsburgh. Guy is absolutely outstanding, moving out to the pocket, getting out of pressure. He's a physical runner. Um, expect Mike Vrabel to, to, to drop some, some running plays down the red zone for Josh Dobbs. Like, that's the kind of dude he is. He's got a big body, so they'll, they'll, they'll use him uh, in, in that regard. For Dallas, on the other hand, I could see there being a little bit of a letdown. You just played, you know, everybody in the media is talking about Dallas, Philly, Dallas, Philly, Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve. Dallas, you know, took care of business, beat Philadelphia. Uh, sort of, I guess, built some new momentum, built some confidence in many, including myself, in terms of whether or not they can make a run in the playoffs. But you got this Thursday night game against the Titans team. It's, it might as well be a preseason game for them because they're playing all backups. Big favorite. I could see Dallas being a little out the gates, let up a bit. I could see it because maybe they're feeling themselves. They beat the best team in the NFC. By the way, the uniforms are incredible this week. You got the color rush uniforms plus a white helmet as opposed to the usual silver helmet. It looks amazing. So I can see Dallas maybe feeling themselves. I've seen this team too many times to totally buy into them, just smoking them right out the gates. So I think they will cover the spread. But I'm going to be a little conservative here. I think my man Josh Jobs keeps Tennessee in it for a while because the Cowboys don't film on him for the most part outside of preseason. But I'm going to take the Cowboys to win this game 31-16 to over the Tennessee Titans. They do cover. I think Dallas goes on a big second-half run uh, to pretty much shut down Tennessee in the second half. Again, I can still see, though, Tennessee, this game is not a, uh, you know, it's not a situation where they're, uh, uh, you know, they have to win. A little bit like Philly last week. Like, if Philly won, great. They win the NFC. If they, if they lost, eh, well, they have two more chances to, to to do that. And Philly, you could see, play very loose. I could see Tennessee doing the same. I absolutely could see that. So, uh, but give me the Cowboys 31-16 to over the Tennessee Titans. Uh, sort of going back to our Lakers topic, Patrick Brown. Lakers are the Cowboys of the NBA, sadly. Rob Palenka is Jerry Jones, who only got the GM position due to being Kobe's former agent. Jeannie Buss has too many people in her ear advising her. That's what I'm saying. There's there's so many similarities between the Lakers and the Cowboys. The two most iconic brands, the most recognizable brands uh, in their respective sports. So, uh, but yeah, I do have the Cowboys though winning tonight, 31 to 16. But I'm just saying, Josh Dobbs puts more fear in me than Malik Willis does. And if I had it my way, I'd say Dak throws five touchdowns, Dobbs throws two. Like that's that's. The, I mean, I want him to play well. It's his first start. Like I. I'm so conflicted here because that was, I mean, I will have to give my mother credit because I know she's listening or watching right now. Shout out to my mom. She was a bigger Dobbs guy or Dobbs guy, Dobbs fan than I was back in the day. I, I came around to him eventually. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously I'm, I'm a hooker guy now. Pause. I'm a Hendon Hooker fan now uh, in, in Tennessee. Uh, hoping he, he he does his thing in the NFL. But uh, I really do want Josh Dobbs to play well, though. I I, I do. I do. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling for him. I'm rooting for a Dak slash Cowboys win, but I would like to see Joshua Dobbs play well because that was my guy at Tennessee. All right, that is all the time we have for today's show. I appreciate everybody stopping by. A big thanks to Alfred Parsar Jr. of the Rocket Fuel Jets podcast. You can go subscribe to the Rocket Fuel Jets YouTube channel as well as to the Grid Podcast Network. Also, 
right here on Carving Up Live. Be sure to like, share, comment, take two seconds out of your day, and hit that big red subscribe button as well as the notification bell. You can notify anytime we upload a video. Just did one the other day about Mac Jones being a dirty player. Ugh. Old Michael McCorkle. Uh, also, be sure to subscribe, as I mentioned earlier, to the Grid Podcast Network. That is G-R-Y-D for the streaming audience. There you go. That is the logo. Real nice and clean for you. The Grid Network. You can subscribe uh, on YouTube. You can also listen to my show uh, on the Grid on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, as well as where iHeartRadio, anywhere you listen to your podcast, that's where you can listen to my show on the grid, as well as obviously Alfred Show, Rocket Fuel Jets podcast. You saw Patrick Brown, shout out to him in the comments, the Chaotic Sports podcast, the All Even podcast, Barry Grant Jr., Clutch Sports Talk, Ryan Flowers, and the Cowboys Can Fan podcast. They'll be live streaming tonight, the game, so be sure to check out their stream tonight if you want to see some uh, live reaction to Cowboys Titans. Definitely go check those guys out over there. So have a great evening, everybody. Continue to stay safe out there. Please continue to take care of your physical and your mental health. God bless you all. Peace out. I hope Dobbs plays well. Thanks so much for watching the show on YouTube. Be sure to click that big red subscribe button and go check out the other clips and full shows of Carving It Up Live. Have a blessed day.